Moik Conversations is where academia and industry meet to discuss open innovation. Ideas, insights, best practices, and diverse perspectives. For academics, practitioners, policymakers, and open innovation enthusiasts. A video session, a podcast, and a good time to share and learn together. My name is Marisol Menendez. My name is Marcel Bogers. And we wait for you every month in a new chapter of World Open Innovation Conversations. Hello everyone, my name is Marcel Bogers and I am Professor of Open and Collaborative Innovation at Eindhoven University of Technology. I'm Marisol Menendez and I'm an open innovation enthusiast and practitioner from many years ago. Hello everyone and welcome today. Yeah, so we're very happy to welcome you to our very first edition of the World Open Innovation Conversations. To give you a little bit of background of what we're trying to do, um, I can maybe say that this is basically a spin-off, you may say, from the World Open Innovation Conference, which is a conference that we have been organizing for several years now with the aim to bridge theory and practice in the domain of open innovation. This is also really what we want to do with these series of conversations, of which this will be uh, the first one. Um, and we hope to create a little bit uh, slightly informal setting uh, where um, world renowned experts uh, in their own domains uh, and open innovation leaders can really discuss amongst themselves um, uh, some specific themes in connection to open innovation. Um, and again, we're happy to kick it off today um, with some really, really good uh, speakers. Um, that will have a hopefully friendly conversation uh, in this very first conversations. Yes, and we've been working so hard into trying to create the best setting. And, you know, open innovation is by nature collaborative, no? And it's a meeting point, and we are trying to create the perfect mix. And we want this to be a meeting point among academia, um, academics and practitioners from different industries, different countries, and having a diverse mix of enthusiasts, practitioners, and those who are studying and looking into the future of open innovation. We want this to be a meeting point and a melting pot of everything that is happening around there, because we know that uh, practitioners can benefit a lot of having a solid base of what's being researched and studied around open innovation. And of course, the connection to the real needs of the industries and the practice is something that academia can be also uh, really looking forward to do. And you know, we want to learn from best practices and to connect both worlds following the spirit of the World Open Innovation Conference. And here we are. And today is a perfect setting to do that. And Marcel, this is a new adventure. We are excited. I am a little bit nervous. I am eager to learn and to listen to our amazing set of speakers for the day. We have friends from all over the world. We brought people from the US and we am from Canada, I think. I'm from Netherlands and we have friends from all over the world. Um, we're excited and happy to be here. Yeah, I have to say I'm also you know, super happy to be here, excited about the session. Uh, yeah, I have to say I'm slightly nervous about it as well, but I think that's the nature of innovation uh, in, in a way. You're not always sure what will, uh, what will come out of it. But I think that's also very much in the spirit of the conference that we have been organizing, trying to come up with new formats and sessions and so on. And I think this is also a, a new uh, initiative and a new experiment. And I think very much, as you say, in the spirit also of open innovation, we try to connect different sources of knowledge from around the world, you know, through this uh, uh, this uh, initiative. And um, I think also, of course, I don't know who will exactly listen to this, but I, I hope we will get, of course, a big audience from uh, various parts of the world, different uh, sectors, industries, and so on. At least I know that in the organizing team of our conference, for example, we have people representing um, uh, industry, consulting, uh, academia as well, of course. 
with affiliations also all over the world, ranging from the US to, to the UK, um, Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, uh, France, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, uh, Austria, uh, Lithuania, and even Australia. And then I hope I didn't forget anyone, but just to say that also in, in the way we organize our conference, we really try to be international and we hope that is the kind of reach that we will also have with these uh, sessions, uh, of course. But of course, we don't want to overwhelm uh, uh, everybody. So we'll take it one step at a time, uh, one episode, uh, one hour, uh, once every month, uh, we'll, we'll try. And this is then the first one. And we also hope it's going to create a bit of a platform for our growing uh, world open innovation uh, community. That's right, Marcel. We are also trying to bring together the open innovation community in this meeting point. And so let's kick it off for the day. First of all, I wanted to come back to the basics and I want to begin asking you one question. Because, you know, we've been talking about open innovation and open innovation and open innovation. And well, of course, I love open innovation as a concept. It's, um, I, it's the thing I love to do, my passion. And I also like to say that is my freaky side, and my geeky side. Um, but I think the first question to ask and maybe to set the ground is to discuss the definition of open innovation. And you know, I remember I took a course in, in ESADE with, my, with Henry and Wim van Gaverbeke uh, twice, in fact, uh, different variations of the same course. Um, and uh, in, in those sessions, I remember perfectly when I learned the, or, and we studied and, and get into the definition of open innovation. And we studied one paper that I love and I have it always at hand that is co-written also by you. So I know you are one of the best people to ask. Please, can you explain us what is open innovation? What is the definition of open innovation? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, so in the, uh, in that, the, the chapter that I co-authored with, with, with Henry, we basically defined open innovation as being a distributed innovation process uh, that's based on purposely managed knowledge flows across organizational boundaries using pecuniary and non-pecuniary mechanisms in line with the organization's business model. Well, that's of course a whole mouthful um, uh, and it's a slightly academic way of phrasing things, but just to briefly unpack this definition, there are basically, I would say four components uh, to it. Um, so first we say that the premise of open innovation is uh, the fact that it's a distributed innovation process. So uh, one thing I liked about also uh, Henry's book back in 2003 is one quote, which said basically something like most of the smartest people work for somebody else. So the whole point is that there are a lot of smart people out there, and this is what open innovation is really building on, the fact that the sources of knowledge are highly distributed and available all over the world, essentially. The second point here is that you know, these, this knowledge doesn't necessarily automatically flow into your organization or out of your organization. There needs to be a process to manage those knowledge inflows or knowledge outflows to either um, accelerate your internal innovation process through external sources of knowledge, or to leverage your internal technologies by reaching out to external partners, for example. Then the third element or component of the definition was these different types of mechanisms. So we distinguish between pecuniary and non-pecuniary has also been identified in the literature. So this basically means that some of these inflows or outflows may be related to monetary exchange, so uh, paying or selling uh, for, for them. Um, but in many cases, uh, such a monetary um, incentive is not really required. And there may be other ways in which knowledge can flow in or out of the organization. And the fourth and final aspect of that definition is that this should all be in line with the organization's business model. Um, because in the end, open innovation is very much about an organization's business model, because you can flow, let knowledge flow in and out what you want, but if it doesn't fit with the way that you as an organization want to create and capture value, 
is not really going to, uh, to help you uh, a, a, a great deal. So also the notion of business model is essential in, uh, in the context of, of using and, and benefiting from uh, open innovation. Well, I think those are the pillars no? where we are building this concept of open innovation. And, you know, I always say that one of the luckiest moments in my life was when I was appointed to create the open innovation department at BBVA. And we were a small team. And the first question to answer is what was open innovation? Because it was pretty new. And uh, what could open innovation do for an organization such as BBVA? And we reached out to Henry, and of course, we dig into that definition and everything that it, it entailed. And we were in a mission of getting people on board of this idea. No? And uh, we like to, well, I like to use this phrase to simplify it and to get to a core of what I think it represents in an organization. And it's a phrase that I saw once a stapled. In fact, it was a, a trip together also with Henry, one of the uh, sessions we were in, in SAP in Germany. And in the door of a bathroom, there was this sign that said that um, the most important innovations will not come from new technologies, but from new ways of collaboration. And it hit me like as part of the core of what we are trying to build. And you know, even if collaboration is as old as humanity, because at the end, the history of humanity is built open the, uh, uh, over these collaboration uh, dynamics. I think nowadays uh, we have these characteristics uh, related to complexity, speed, and the amount of connections that we have all around the world, crossing sectorial boundaries, different actors for different uh, challenges, and even with, well, this complexity uh, embedded to everything what, that we are doing nowadays. Hmm? Yeah, no, exactly. And then in, in, in a way, that's also, you know, tapping into some of those complex uh, concepts is exactly what we want to do in today's session as well. Uh, because uh, as a theme of, of this first uh, series of conversations, we've identified um, uh, the notion of grand challenges. So we really want to discuss uh, open innovation and grand challenges, or the connection between these two topics, um, essentially because um, you know, as a global society, we, we are really facing uh, some um, pretty complex um, uh, and systemic problems. Um, just looking at uh, earlier uh, this week, actually, the report of IPCC on the impact of climate change, um, those kinds of problems um, are, are really quite severe uh, and important to address, but also difficult to do so. Um, because it's also not the type of problem that any single organization can really address. So this is why I think it's very fitting to, uh, to kick off these conversations um, with discussing uh, the notion of grand challenges and the role of uh, open innovation. Yeah, basically, uh, I, I hope we can have a good discussion um, around that, because almost by definition, uh, the solution to grand challenges will also involve open innovation in one form or the other. That's right, Marcel. So I think that we are ready to go into our next uh, section today. And because we are organized by sections. <laughs> so <laughs> after this a warm uh, welcome and intro, I think we are ready to welcome our guests and open our panel. We have three uh, distinguished guests, I would say, uh, three experts in, in their domains, uh, namely uh, Henry Chesbro, Anita McGann, and Miguel uh, Arias. Um, let me first introduce briefly um, Henry Chesbro. So Henry Chesbro is uh, an adjunct professor and faculty director of the Garwood Center for Corporate Innovation at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, he is also known as the father of open innovation as he launched the term um, in a book back in 2003, which really sparked um, a broad range of research and practices in that domain. Um, so we're very happy to have Henry uh, on board. Welcome, Henry. Thank you so much, Marcel. And hello to Marisol. Hi, Henry. Uh, and then we'll move to uh, Anita McGann. So Anita um, McGann, 
is working at the University of Toronto, where she is a university professor, professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and also a professor of strategic management at the Rotman School of Management. She has covered a wide range of topics. She's particularly interested in, um, for example, private entrepreneurship in the public uh, interest, has published on a wide range of uh, areas, such as uh, industry change, sustainable competitive advantage. But I think in the context of today's session, it's also important to know that she has a particular interest in global health and the diffusion of knowledge across organization, uh, not only organizational, but also international boundaries. Welcome, Anita. Thank you. And let me introduce Miguel Arias. Um, Miguel and I go back uh, many years ago as well, you know, so we are truly among friends today. Um, and I really admire him and his profile because he knows in depth uh, many different aspects of the ecosystem. So he's been an entrepreneur, he's been in a corporate managing um, open innovation for Telefonica for many years as well. And now he's in the investment side, being partner of K Fund, which is one of the main uh, funds here in Spain. Miguel, we are happy to have you today. Hello. Hello, it's really great to be here. I'm learning so much already, so I'm maybe going to stay silent, I don't know. <laughs> so we are ready set, Marcel. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much, everybody, for, for, for coming. Uh, we're looking forward to your conversation. Um, so the setting we want to create is, you know, being in a, you know, in, an, in, a, in a cozy room, drinking, uh, you know, a coffee or whatever your favorite beverage may be, you know, together, just talking about this notion of, you know, grand challenges and, and open innovation. So as if we're meeting, you know, among friends and, and maybe some people are, are listening in. So basically the question we want to kick off with, and I think I'll ask Henry to, uh, uh, to kick off the discussion and, and you can all of course uh, uh, jump in with your own perspectives. But the question uh, we want to uh, kick off this conversations with is basically, uh, from your point of view, what are the grand challenges of today and how can open innovation be useful for addressing them? Um, Henry, what do you think? Let's see, I think I'm going to start with a, a tiny bit of history and then move to the present. Uh, more than 60 years ago, when Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union, it created a sense of crisis in the United States and a sense that uh, the US and even free markets were behind uh, the communists in the race to space. And the response was a very strong uh, grand challenge, namely to put a man on the moon and get him back safely to the earth, what became known as a moonshot. But what was interesting is that to execute that grand challenge, uh, we created a massive public bureaucracy called NASA. Uh, and it was all done in the public sector, hundreds of thousands of employees, hundreds of billions of dollars of expenditure. So although Marisol was saying rightly that collaboration is quite old, the initial response in my view was quite closed and not very open. Uh, it was all done inside a very, very large bureaucracy. Now we move to the present. Today, there is no public bureaucracy big enough and well-funded enough to address the, the grand challenges that we face. We must find ways to move knowledge across organizational boundaries in both the private and the public sector and find ways to harmonize and align the innovation activities that need to happen to address these really, really substantial challenges we face. And climate change, as you were saying, Marcel, is both a topical one because of the recent IPCC report, but even when Anita McGann joined us at the World Open Innovation Conference in Rome back in 2019, she used her keynote speech to call on us to lift our, her, our gaze above the day-to-day -day and think longer term Think strategically, not just for a market, not just for a company, 
but really for our society, our fellow citizens, and our children in the future. Uh, and to do this, we have to align these visions. We have to connect to or discover relevant business models to make these things both sustainable and scalable. So they can really reach across the society, across the economy in many countries to really get to a critical mass that can really make an impact on these grand challenges. So maybe I'll stop there uh, and uh, let my colleagues uh, on the panel take over. Miguel, did you want to go next? It's uh, yes. there's a lot of great issues on the table. Yeah, I mean, I was listening to Henry, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's talking about all the grand challenges, and I was thinking how this relates to my tiny daily challenges, right? <laughs> I mean, because I, <laughs> I would say that when when you're trying to to bring open innovation to an organization, the the biggest issue that, that we found at, at Telefonica is that, and we had the great luxury of doing this for 10 years, right? We had the patience and the support of the management team. So that, that's already a, a great gift, right? So, but moving from this grand challenge on cooperation and tackling uh, the, big, the big issues of the world, what I found then is that there was so much more activity, so little activity has been done everywhere. And it was very hard to, to find what is the, the key goal, which is the meaningful results, right? And, and, and when I was trying to then digest that into something more concrete, I think that the biggest issue that we found is how to get to scale. How you, because it's, it's great to start things. Everybody starts things. Everybody does some demo days, works with somebody else. But from, the, from that into the scale, I found three key interfaces that were the, the issue. One was people, how you're able to make people uh, be much less risk averse and, 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 and take, take the, the guts to the things. The second was processes, how you were able to speed up things at scale. And the third one, which is non, non, not small, was technology. You, you can't do a POC without technology. You cannot uh, sell something to 100,000 people or, or change our full economy without enabling technologies, right? So these are the three, three key things that I found as key challenges, moving from the, the grand goals that Henry mentioned into the tiny issues of the corporation. <laughs> Well, Telefonica is not so tiny. I mean, it's it's wonderful to uh, <laughs> yeah. be in this conversation with you, Miguel, because Telefonica has been a real leader, of course, in the world in 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 bringing communications technology to many people who have never had a landline telephone or had even a mobile phone um, yeah. across uh, the global south, especially. So it's very it's wonderful to hear you hear you describe you know what you're doing and how you're thinking about this. I guess for me, just to um, throw out a couple of thoughts as for me, you know, the, the way I think of what the grand challenges are you know, is shaped by the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which are kind of imperfect. Some of them are very technological. And uh, there's uh, also questions about kind of tensions between different elements of those SDGs. But as a starting point, those were you know, vetted by a lot of stakeholders and they're, they're, it's a good list to begin with, for me anyway, just kind of putting a stake in the ground of what grand challenges are. And I would say that chief among them, of course, are, the, are addressing the pandemic, which is uh, raising all sorts of insights about disenfranchisement of people who are hard to reach, um, either economically or because they're vulnerable socially, or because they're uh, geographically uh, remote. Uh, so Black Lives Matter, you know, um, there's, there's, a, there's a whole architecture of the reasons why we have the pandemic that has become painfully clear as, as it's progressed. So there's, uh, the pandemic is a grand challenge, not just because we need vaccines and we need people to take vaccines, but also because of all of the all of the complicitness of these structural problems that we had before the pandemic that have led to the distribution of illness, you know, uh, especially uh, concentrated among among vulnerable people, poorer people, people who are in frontline jobs, essential workers, people who, people of color, people who are who have. Um, don't have good information about uh, about what the disease is and how it can be how it can be managed. 
Um, and then the other, another huge issue is climate change. We have to, I mean, Marcel, uh, you know, mentioned this in his opening remarks, uh, is describing the, the report that just came out in the last couple of days. We are past the tipping point. We have to act in a coordinated way. And, you know, the, there are many other important uh, grand challenges that are in those SDGs. You know, we have to think about we have to think about environmental pollution. We have to think about job quality. We have to think about enfranchisement of of um, of uh, women and and uh, people of uh, you know many people who have been excluded because of their race and many many other uh, inequities that need to be addressed. And we have to do it with good governance. And there's a whole list there that's very compelling for me. Putting that in perspective against the open innovation agenda, for me, really has been uh, very powerful. And one of the things that has happened since the open in World Open Innovation Conference that Marcel and Henry invited me to, and Agnieszka invited me to uh, a couple of years ago, we have seen what kind of coordinated action is possible in the response of global pharmaceutical companies, for example, and telecommunications companies and the yeah. media and so on to the pandemic itself. We've seen innovation and collaboration at scale across organizations in a distributed way. And I, I don't know, Henry, what do you think? I mean, I have been blown away by what's been accomplished. I think we are all thrilled to see how fast and how far the vaccine development in particular uh, to a lesser extent, also personal protective equipment and some of the social technologies have come. And yet, as you rightly point out, Anita, we have also exposed some of the continuing gaps uh, and limits. Uh, in one of my classes, I teach how the Gates Foundation has been trying to eradicate polio and how we're just down to a couple of pockets of polio now in northern Nigeria uh, and in uh, Pakistan. Uh, and how hard it is to get those last cases to get truly down to zero. Well, with the pandemic, we initially thought we need to get the vaccine and we achieved that very well. But now we're finding, to Miguel's point about scaling, we've got to get this vaccine to everyone. Because as long as there are significant populations that are unvaccinated, these are petri dishes in laboratories to create new variants. Uh, of the COVID disease, and that this can be uh, a continuing cycle of infection and breakthroughs and economic uh, shutdowns and losses. We've got to find ways to really get to global scale uh, across all of the planet. And, and indeed, ironically, in, in an open innovation conversation, the national responses to a first approximation have been to shut down borders and enclose societies, restrict the movement of people. Uh, and this I think makes the world much worse off. So we really need scale uh, to get back to a world where we can truly engage and get those distributed knowledge flows moving the way we want them to. I, I wanted to challenge a little bit this idea of scale because I think it's kind of a different kind of scale than we have had in the past. And Miguel, I mean, Telefonic has been such a pioneer in this, but I always think of scale economies, Henry, the way that you and I studied them back when we were, you know, doctoral students, I don't know, some, a couple of decades ago. Uh, sure, and, and rookie professors together rookie at professors. Harvard Business School. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, scale is a very industrial era idea. It's this idea that, one of the things that's true about scale is that, you know, you're trying to get the unit cost down by creating volumes, but there's a sort of boundary against which uh, you can't, you can no longer lower costs. And polio is an amazing example. I've been working also on the polio eradication campaigns with a groups of students uh, in a project we call Reach, Reaching the Hard to Reach, uh, at uh, Toronto. I'd love to tell you about that more another time. But uh, this is. Uh, it's this idea that there are people beyond the boundary on what scale economies can be achieved. And those hard to reach people are gonna be the last cases of polio and, and are gonna to continue to suffer a burden from COVID until we innovate in a way that our systems are designed to get past those boundaries on scale economies. And Telefonica does that. Telefonica has been 
you know, increasing in size in the global, how do you do this? <laughs> how do you do it economically? Given that scale, classic scale economies are not available in these communities. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting point. And I, I think we are doing there is partnering actually with other organizations, right? I mean, I, I, we realize we cannot do this kind of things on our own. And, and there is another thing that, that we learned over the years, and that is being true now as being shown by the vaccines, right? That small teams of very committed individuals can achieve amazing things. So you don't need very big teams. Uh, uh, take it back into your comment. You don't need big teams to achieve things at scale. <laughs> you can have very small teams uh, developing things at the frontiers of technology that can then have a, a global impact, right? And actually that's the point why I moved to the BC world Recently, I, I was thinking, uh, and I also thinking about what was Henry just said. I mean, the, the idea that with all these challenges on, on climate emergency, I was thinking what my grandsons or granddaughters would ask me 30 years from now, right? I mean, hey, Miguel, what did you do in, in this time, right? And, and I was thinking the bigger thing you can do at this stage, having connections and, and your little knowledge is to maybe support these small teams of very committed individuals, right? And, and actually, because I do think that, I mean, I was hearing Henry, I think he was a bit a bit more uh, bearish and I think I'm a bit more bullish around this new normal. I like more the new than the normal. So <laughs> thinking about the new part of what is coming after the pandemic, I, I'm really thinking, and, and Telefonica is also betting on that, that this, is, this tectonic shift of technologies, of enabling technologies happening right now. The, the intersection between 5G and cloud computing and IoT and AI, all of that is gonna then create this, um, I don't know, perfect storm of disruption that is gonna enable new, new ways of solving these challenges that we're thinking right now. So Miguel, I love your optimism and uh, I very much am hopeful uh, that you're right. Uh, one of the things that I like about Telefonica is, to me, it's a different country, sorry, it's a different company in different countries around the world. Oh, yeah. In, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. Spain and Portugal, it's the incumbent, it's the legacy company, it's the establishment, if you will. Uh, but in many of the, the South America, Latin America countries, Telefonica is the challenger. It's the insurgent. It's the one bringing new ideas, new possibilities, new offerings uh, against the establishment, against the incumbents in those markets. And so although Telefonica is a global company, uh, I found that different parts of the company behaved differently and mm -hmm. thought differently uh, in these different parts of the world. And so one of the things I think open innovation can bring to grand challenges is how do we take these imperatives that we all agree need to be addressed, how do we craft sustainable, and I'll still use the word scalable business models to address mm -hmm. them? And so to me, Telefonic is an example of this where it isn't a one size fits all around the world. It actually does things pretty differently uh, in different regions of the world. And I think this is part of what we need to yep. connect the grand challenges and utilize open innovation to try to drive new solutions. One thing that comes up to my mind when I'm listening to everything that you are setting in is that um, all these grand challenges are by nature a connector among sectors and among disciplines, you know, because the grand challenges exceed any boundary from specific sectors. No, we were talking about this case that, like with Telefonica, but uh, I'm talking with, for example, health companies that need the support from technology and also, of course, from, um, I don't know, education teams, no? Right. So what's your perspective about this um, intersectorial and maybe interdisciplinary nature of the grand challenges? Henry, I, I, Miguel, I don't know um, if what I'm about to say is, is uh, appropriate, but I think organizations pretty much are tools for getting things done. And what we need to do is really reinvent the corporation, reinvent the organization in many sectors. Um, the goal, you know, again, dating myself a little bit here, but back when I was, you know, getting going in my career, our world, our goal in the field of academic research and strategic management was to sustain the organization. 
I don't think that's so interesting anymore. I think organizations are going to have to fulfill their purpose and then, um, you know, move along uh, uh, here if they and 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 be, you know, integrated into other organizations or even disbanded if they no longer are creating value uh, that's important. I. I I really see us as entering a time when we need to unleash the creative capacity of everybody on the planet in an alignment toward uh, remediating climate change and refocusing human actualization, um, organizational activity on, on what's really important to us, which probably is not going to be stuff like consuming more Doritos. You know, it's, it's going to be on creating deeper connections, stronger relationships, more meaningful, um, you know, uh, communities, more, uh, more healthful, more rewarding ways of interacting, less consumption, less polluting the environment, less leaving people out, less, you know, troubling, uh, you know, misunderstood, deep, deep kind of populist misunderstandings and more, um, more creative ways of getting us to work together. So for me, the open agenda, the open innovation agenda connects to grand challenges first around bringing in the hard to reach, bringing in everybody on the planet, just as Miguel and others were saying, Henry was saying, we can't leave Northern Nigeria out from COVID vaccines. If there's COVID anywhere on the planet, we're all threatened. So it brings, bringing everyone into the system. And then secondly, um, pardon me, Miguel, did you want to interrupt there? No, no, no. no. I, I, no, no. I, I, was, I was super excited about the idea of reinventing the, the, corporation, the corporation, right? I oh, mean, I, 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 I think, I mean, and, and following on what uh, Henry said around the telephonic is different in different countries, but I think that each of the 100,000 employees of a big corporation like Telefonica or any other need to be like an, an API of something. They need to be enablers of something, anyone, right? And APIs of collaboration, each and every one of them, right? And I think that this, this needs to be done through a radical empowerment. And, I, and if you achieve that, then as you said, the corporation is a, a means towards an end that will shape itself <laughs> towards cooperation with different different bodies, right? And I like this very much. So I was just excited about you with your comment. Oh, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, just to, the last thought I was going to offer is that uh, new digital technologies like AI and machine learning have the potential to uh, really accelerate that. And I was just going to say that uh, I, I'm inspired by what Anita just said about yep. thinking about the purpose of corporations is to get things <laughs> done and to get things done that society needs to get done uh, and not just eat more Doritos. Though I love Doritos, but that's not the purpose. <laughs> uh, the other, but I would also observe that we're, uh, we're going to do this in market economies. Uh, with yeah. we're, we're not going back to command and control and central planning. We're going to do these in market economies. And that means we're going to have to find ways to align the economic interests of these actors, as well as our societal interests. And so, as Marcel said in the definition of open innovation, the business model is an important part of that concept because it's the business model that tells you what things to look for to bring in from the outside to enhance your innovation and what things to allow to go out for others to use in their organizations. And that, and sometimes that can actually advance your business and your business model to share, to share openly, to get others to use them because that may be complementary to something you're trying to do. So we have to do this in the logic of a market economy. Uh, and so I think that's where the art and the challenge of blending open innovation and grand challenges come together. Wow. This is amazing, guys. Uh, unfortunately, we are reaching out to the last part of this uh, session. So may I ask if each of you to give a final thought, a uh, call to action, what would be your conclusion from this conversation? I guess my conclusion is please come to Eindhoven on December 9th and 10th of 2021 for what will be the eighth annual World Open Innovation Conference. Uh, I am proud to be the organizer of the first seven of the conferences, and I'm thrilled that Marcel and his team are taking on the eighth conference in Eindhoven. My, my final thought would be that open innovation gives us tools, ways of thinking, mindsets 
that are an entry point into designing the kinds of institutional innovations that we need, the organizational innovations that we need to get things like, you know, electric vehicle recharging stations across entire countries and new medicines to combat important diseases and so on. And that uh, it's, a, it's, this gives us a way of deconstructing grand challenges into, in, into um, intermediate uh, goals. So, you know, so that we can actually make progress in addressing them. Well, my, I think my, my thoughts are that we, we will see an evolution into uh, fluid relationships, into uh, dynamic shapes of organizations that we're going to be able to, to tackle the grand challenges we mentioned before. And open innovation is a key component of that. Yeah, I, I think this is just really amazing insights. And, and, and I really you know, love the, the, the conversation you've been uh, having here and, and a lot of... Um, what I find interesting, I think a lot of things, you know, I've somehow, you know, discussed before with some of you and other people, but there are also really some new perspectives. And I really like also how you connect some of the dots, because I think in a way also when we want to really address, uh, you know, the grand challenges, I think many of the solutions uh, we already have in a way, um, you know, we, 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 you know we, we know about the nature of the grand challenges, you know, we have all these organizations, we have all the, all the smart people out there. I think what I observe also from, from what you're saying is that it's really important to connect uh, some of those things. And uh, if we think about also reinventing the or organization, of course, we are still starting from, from the people we, we already have, from the experiences that, that we have. And, and uh, this is also an interesting challenge, I think, in the context of systemic uh, problems. How do you change them sort of from, from within? Um, but I, I really learned quite a few things about how also an open innovation model and mindset may actually play a role in doing that, maybe on the small scale, but also on the larger scale. So I think this is really the large agenda that's lying uh, uh, ahead of us. We have now the perfect mood to keep digging into what's uh, underlying the, the, the conversation about the grand challenges that we have today. And we've discussed many times today that one of our objectives in putting together these conversations is to bring together the academic, academic world and the practice world, you know, what's happening in real life in businesses. So I'm from the practitioner side, you know, even though I've been trying to get into the academic world uh, even trying myself to get into a PhD, but I discovered firsthand that that's not <laughs> compatible, but I must tell you that I will solve it. I'm sure I will get there. But anyway, um, I really admire and I learn a lot when I'm trying, when I understand that what is happening in real life has uh, research and experiments behind that and even a next step to build upon. I enjoy a lot being close to the academic world. I enjoy these experiments promoted uh, beginning with Henry and everything happening around the World Open Innovation Conferences. I enjoy um, the open innovation seminars where we gather to discuss uh, between academics and practitioners. For me, this is simply a, a, a door to an amazing world full of people that I can't help but admire and a little bit envy because I wish I had this academic um, depth that you have. And one of the people that I admire the most is Agnieszka, uh, who is together with us. And we are opening this a small section where we want to dig deeper into what's happening in the academic world. You know, from my corner of the world, this overview of elements and tools um, on, on what's happening in the academic world would be an amazing insight to all those practitioners who want to have um, a, a support on a academic and theory it's, uh, about what's happening in real life. Agnieszka, welcome. Please, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Thank you so much, uh, Marisol and Marcel. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is uh, Agnieszka Radziwon, and I'm an assistant professor of innovation management and work at uh, Horst University. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the University of uh, California, Berkeley, Garwood Center for Corporate Innovation. Um, it's been a wonderful discussion 
great insights and of course amazing people so it was it was a pleasure to to, to listen to the discussion and I, I wanted to offer you um some of the reactions so, to what has been said and this is going to be sort of uh, spiced up with uh current and future research ideas so uh, if you don't have after this uh if, after this discussion if you don't have enough and you would like to dig into some of the academic papers i just try to share uh some of the highlights and I'm very much, you know, kind of a structured person. So I wanted to offer some kind of a structure for, for, for this part. So I would like to focus on different units of analysis, different tools and different themes. Again, related to current and future research, combining grand challenges and open innovation. Let's start with the unit of analysis because um, Anita, Henry and Miguel, they've been mentioning sort of uh, different levels of analysis and problems that kind of concern some of them. So I guess the first one, the, the closest one to all of us um, is the society. Uh, and then if it goes for, for the society, of course, pandemic is something that hit us very, 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 very hard. And this is one, one of the reasons why we got um, a lot of inspiration. I got, a, uh, we got lots of mobilization and um, probably motivation to get some more synergies. And of course, um, Anita, together with, with Henry and Marcel, they did a great job writing about them. So if you would like to read a little bit more about uh, tackling societal challenges with open innovation, also you know, from the pre-pandemic stage, which can also influence after pandemic stage, I would definitely recommend you um, their paper in California Management Review uh, from 2021. And you know, one of the research question that comes both out of the, the current situation of pandemic and links to the future research would be how, um, how to leverage open innovation to, to make sure that we establish some sort of a pandemic preparedness. You know, we, we, we used to have some challenges even before the pandemic, but of course it's, it's very important to work, um, to work towards the future. And here we have pandemics, but also we can think about different grand challenges um, related to, uh, to cancer and different types of drug discovery, where open innovation could also help in exchanging the knowledge in, in different ways. Then, of course, a very important area mentioned several times by Miguel, businesses, the, the industry. Um, and here um, we have Delander and Velling 2020 Howard Business Review paper where the authors um, actually explain why the time for open innovation is now and what they come up with. And again, this could help us in regards to uh, COVID pandemic, but also some other challenges. These are ideas related to open IP or opening up the IP, uh, as well as getting some of the new partnerships. Of course, when we think about opening up uh, IP and patents and so on. It sounds like a great idea, but now one of the research questions that that or one of the questions that that, that I have would be related to um, capabilities. So even if we're going to open up and share the IP, are people who are going to use it? Are they ready? Do they have sufficient capabilities to make the production running to achieve the same quality as the original? Uh, patent owners who has tremendous experience and, and developing some, some products and also offering some, some services around it. So I think that there are several question marks which, which we still have. Next level, very important one, scientists. And we've been talking about exchanging knowledge. This could be knowledge about climate change, about sustainability, other areas. Um, but I think we all, being in science and outside, we can see that traditional methods and you know silos, even within science, they don't get us too far. So one of the new concepts proposed within the open innovation family is the open innovation and in science. And this is where um, Beck at all 2020 and industry and innovation, uh, they offered a definition of open innovation and in science. And they suggest the ways how this new constellation of actors uh, could help in developing novel, innovative uh, ideas. Of course, we can we can also think that okay, so how is that going to going to work? And knowing some of the 
specialties of, or some characteristic, characteristics of the academic work, we can always consider, okay, but what about this scientific ambidexterity? I mean, our scientists will be really able to um, get the crowds or get the society involved in solving some problems and at the same time develop high quality science. So I think that we definitely need to look for new methods also within research. But I think one of the concerns and also question would be how to maintain high quality research and how to propose a proper um, selection measures or idea selection measures in order to make sure that we really progress instead of you know going back. Last but not least, and within the part of units of analysis, this is going to be a little bit new area, at least for innovation management. And this is the area related to policymakers and more specifically the geopolitical landscape. So I think that pandemic showed us how important it is to collaborate not only between companies, but also between nations. And this, this was something that um, has been already mentioned by, by Anita and colleagues that we shouldn't forget about countries which cannot necessarily afford to get uh, vaccines in the first place because we are in it all together. So we cannot just suddenly uh, you know, focus on people that, that have means to, um, to pay, to buy vaccines and just to do it quickly because we are not going to curb the pandemic if we forget about everyone else who is you know, not in the forefront of this discussion. So one of the questions that um, would be interesting in the context of both grand challenges um, as well as open innovation uh, is related to national capabilities of um, sharing the knowledge, of developing um, the knowledge and of absorbing and the knowledge later on. I'm slow to get into the end. So two more things um, I wanted to highlight. Within these units of analysis, we've started to develop um, different tools. And then by tools, um, I say diff different ways of how do we exchange and collect uh, information. Um, one of these ways uh, is related to hackathons. So back in 2017, uh, Borgers et al. and Industry Innovation started to mention or highlighting that hackathons might be an interesting tool that we may start using in the future. And this is a tool which could help us in generating new ideas and potentially also evaluating these ideas just to select um, the best ones. And hackathons started to be very, very popular during the pandemics. And this is also one of the, one of the tools that um, started to help us in exchanging knowledge uh, and sort of uh, carving the pandemic. So here I could recommend the paper of uh, Bertello et al, 2021, um, from R&D management special issue. And in general, the R&D management special issue about uh, COVID-19 and best business practices. I think this would be also a good place uh, to, to look into, both for academics as well as professionals, just to see what are the hands-on experiences and what are the positive uh, experiences from the pandemics. Marcel, do you want to join me? Or is this the time where we should actually move to the practitioners and give the space to Graham? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. I think that we got a perfect review of all the interesting uh, research here. And, you know, one thing I wanted to emphasize from this practitioner corner that I'm sitting in is that uh, research begins with a good question. Is the, the first element of what you are looking into and this uh, forest of questions that have been researched and dig into are creating a set of tools, no? And mm -hmm. I, I hope that we, uh, you presented us with many good questions also that are still open uh, for future researchers, but also for, for those practitioners who are tackling those challenges. But indeed, I think now we will move to the uh, to the to the practice or the practitioner side in in a sense, uh, because you know as we said in the beginning, you know we really want to bring ac uh, academia and industry uh, together, really try to you know have this blend of theory um, and practice, and hopefully also get some insight into you know what's happening in the real world out there in terms of you know different 
uh, you know, cases across industries, countries, or, you know, and, uh, and so on. And for this, we, you know, we had invited uh, Graham Cross, um, I think connecting from the Netherlands too, like, uh, like myself. Um, yeah, so Graham, I mean, we, we, we met uh, some years ago, I think probably we were even connected through Henry, <laughs> possibly. Um, and, you know, I, I know that you have a long um, a career at Unilever, uh, where I think you started more on the technical side in R&D, but also through different management functions, uh, really became a true open innovation practitioner. So we're really looking forward to hearing from you, uh, from your own experience and your reflections on this session. So maybe you can uh, briefly uh, introduce yourself and then provide your perspective on, uh, on today's topic. So yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, thanks, Marcel. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm Graham Cross. Uh, great to be with you all uh, this evening. The, um, yeah, I'm a chemist. I'm an organic chemist uh, who actually did his PhD with Pfizer. Can you believe that? The company now the whole world has suddenly heard of, right? Um, yeah, I've had a, a long career in industry and that's always been a balance between innovation practice with my bare hands and innovation theory and process with the other spare hands. Um, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about that and actually in the context of what's just been discussed the last 45 minutes, I think has been an amazing introduction to this topic. Uh, and, and, you know, there's something I think hidden behind what we've said up until now, and that is, you know, what is the role of industry in all, all that we've discussed here? You know, we have grand challenges. Great. We have massive challenges that society faces. Great. But what's the role of industry within that? And I think, Henry, as you mentioned, you talked about market economies. Yeah? So how does industry play and contribute and how is that all going to work in the presence of market economies? And maybe there's some good news hidden within all of this, because I think anybody in industry in recent years who hasn't been exposed more often than they care to remember to the word purpose has probably got a hearing problem, right? So there has been a vast discussion about purpose, purpose, and more purpose. Corporate social responsibility is not enough. It's about something way beyond that, purpose. And if you ask yourself the question, what is purpose? Actually, it's very personal. Now, the, the IPCC report that we've heard this week has, and has been mentioned already has impacted us all because it is very personal. This is an existential kind of thing. How much more personal, personal do you want to make it? So maybe the good news here uh, is that every employee in every company and every boss in every company, they are people on this very same planet facing now quite overtly some of the same grand challenges. So I think one of the really interesting factors within this is if we were to abuse the word for a moment and, and, and describe a company as an ecosystem of people, <laughs> then we may find ourselves, you know, quite optimistic about you know, mankind's ability to stand up now and say, I'm not going to accept this the way it is anymore. I want an integrated and more holistic change to go on around me. And certainly the, 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 the youth of today, when they join an organization, when they join industry, are doing that with probably a very different mindset to the mindset that I joined industry with. And that's going to be very important, I think, in shaping what the values are, the norms are, the purpose becomes, and the contribution is that companies make. So I think that's really, really important. And of course, we've uh, it, to accentuate all of this even more, I mean, let's be honest, all of us in this call, what we've heard this week wasn't a surprise to any of us. If we're really honest and just look in that mirror, we all knew what was coming. And so, you know, warnings about global imperatives, you know, have turned into evidence that it's possibly even too late in some regards. So if we don't wake up now, frankly, then we're all asleep. Time to wake up, all of us, wherever we are in academia, industry, and linked together and united, I believe, by a notion like open innovation. Um, so industry has to step up. Uh, I, I've read things this week and, and the, literally things this week saying, you know, industries that, that are dependent upon fossil, fuel, fossil fuels, I'll try that again, industries that are dependent upon fossil fuels will become zombies. So we should pause for five seconds and ask, ask ourselves the industry, can you think of an industry that isn't somehow currently dependent upon fossil fuels? You probably can't in the end. So that is a big change. Now, Again, I think there's something relatively positive within that. And that is, you know, if we think about um, having your back against the wall, the need for change, a burning platform, that is one of the classic things that does get people moving and get change to happen. 
you know, without that, what we've seen historically is that large incumbent firms stick to their current business model, their current value chain, their current way of working and get caught out by disruptors yeah? who are not playing that game, but come in to play a slightly different game and, and win at the new game, as it were. Now, now we've got an occasion when everybody's current game has to change somehow. So this is going to be an innovation rich period of history. Um, this is the Olympics of innovation coming at us right now to choose a recent topic, right? We're heading for the Olympics of innovation where we have to win the gold medal. Uh, but this time we have to win it collectively. The pandemic has shown us that winning it individually is losing it. Just think about that for a minute. Think of the number of leaders celebrating around the world that they've won it individually when the definition of losing it is to only have won it individually, right? That's a very new game for us all to play, but I think a very exciting one. The, per the perfect conditions are then arising that, are, um, that we need for disruption to happen. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to do the unthinkable, uh, Marisol, if I may. I'm going to say the unthinkable thing. Uh, and that is this, you know, in that definition of open innovation, and I think Marcel, you were saying it yourself so so beautifully, you know, um, we talked about uh, distributed innovation pro pro uh, innovation processes, uh, knowledge flows, uh, pecuniary, non-pecuniary, and you said in line with business models, right? And yet we know that one of the things that is being innovated the fastest today is business models. So is it not the case that the very magnitude of change we're going through requires and actually invites new business models to be created, new value chains to be created that can deliver solutions that we could never have done with the old business models. And I, this is an area where I see industry now starting to reconnect itself, you know, and, and it's almost, I mean, it's classical open innovation, I think, Henry, as you described it my capability in your business model, your capability in my business model, and who knows maybe our capabilities in his or her business model over there that we're not even currently part of. And I think this is where the, the, the um, co collaboration and bringing together these capability sets can create the game-changing things that we really need now to affect and to execute the disruption that is becoming an imperative in the context of the grand challenges. Now, every company I speak with is looking at the strategy, is looking at what their future might be like, is asking the question, are the products and the services that currently make my P&L work, <laughs> are they products and services that have a place in this future world? Because if they're not, then I'd better start thinking about what I really am and what I want, really want to be and how I want to change early enough to be able to effect that change before it's too late or before somebody else comes in and takes my space. So it takes us all the way back to questions like jobs to be done. You know, what do my products really do? What do my services really do? What will those needs look like? in 10 or 20 years time in that new world? And how do I get myself to that place early enough, get my assets aligned with those kind of activities um, early enough to, to, to be the winner in that new space? And then indeed market economies can determine success and be motivating for success, but they will be very different companies that we're looking at. So, um, you know, um, I think there's one other thing that may be a bit reassuring in this. Some of the grand challenges we've talked about here, whether we're talking about inequality in societies, uh, climate change, environmental damage, and the, and the whole list of them, um, they have to be reversed. I mean, let's just make it clear, they have to be reversed. We have to do something about it. And so if industry as we know it today doesn't stand up and do something, then somebody else will. And I think what will happen is that ecosystems of smaller organizations will come together to do that. And that will be open innovation itself. We've all, we all talk a lot about ecosystems and ecosystem innovation. Most of the time, we're not entirely clear what we mean, but here maybe is an opportunity to, to see people who are like-minded in being purposeful about making a positive change, simply joining hands, joining assets, bringing capabilities together and delivering that very change. And doing it, you know, if large corporations 
through their incumbent character are slow to change, then guess what? Somebody else will get there first. And that's probably good news for all of us. So Marcel, those are a few words of introduction for me on this topic. I hope that uh, moves us on a little bit further in the conversation. I don't know you, but I'm happy, proud, inspired, and really excited of having this uh, World Open Innovation Conversations going. Absolutely, yeah. Now, I think this has been an amazing uh, uh, a kickoff uh, of, of our series of conversations, and uh, I think extremely uh, insightful uh, from many different angles. Uh, lots of uh, food for thought, but hopefully also call for action for both uh, research and, and practice. Thank you very much, guys. Henry, Anita, Miguel, Agnieszka, and Graham. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, Marcel. I'm truly inspired. And I'm happy because we were nervous, but we created an amazing session, first session of our World Open Innovation Conversations. I think that we are really up to something. I was inspired and I got so many good questions and I learned so much. How do you feel? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think it was um, really a big success which is not certain when you do an innovation or experiment. So I think so far, uh, so good for sure. Um, I also really liked some of the topics that, that came up. Um, and in fact, I think uh, you know, part of the, the, the conclusions actually link to our next episode uh, as well, uh, because this episode was of course about open innovation and uh, grand challenges, but the next one will be related to innovation ecosystems, which in a way is part of the answer of how we want to uh, address grand challenges in an open and collaborative way. So I'm, I think that will be a great theme for the next episode also. Uh, so I'm already looking forward to that as well. And me too. You know, now I'm kind of obsessed with ecosystems. It's part of my line of work right now. And I'm truly eager to have these discussions and keep with this connection between academia and industry and different kind of insights. And of course, finding the right questions to solve and to build the future with. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think, you know, also the connection between, um, you know, industry and, and academia, I think is really important in, uh, in, 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 in general. And that's what we really want to explore, of course, in, in these uh, world open innovation conversations. Uh, but I also hope people will look into our World Open Innovation Conference, um, which will be in December uh, in Eindhoven here in the Netherlands, where we also want to have similar types of conversations, but of course, uh, among colleagues uh, who attend that conference. Uh, and I think we will discuss many of the themes that we also discuss in our conversations here. I know that this, like having this conversation multiplied by 10, because you find so many interesting people there. And, you know, I said uh, during our conversation today that um, I feel that what we were talking about today is kind of permanent, that maybe we'll hear and listen to this podcast again in one year and we will keep uh, having the same questions and maybe even different insights. That's why it's so important that we will be posting videos and audios in different channels of course, in our webpage, worldopeninnovationconference.com. Am I right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then in all our social media, because we will have it in LinkedIn, in Instagram, and we will do as much as noise as possible. So please follow us and keep listening to it, because I think that this will be food for thought in the long term. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and of course, also a big thanks to our, our great team who's helping to, to make these uh, uh, conversations happen uh, behind the scenes. Uh, Jacob, uh, Atabik and Fernando in particular. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that is really a great uh, part of this uh, experiment, so to say. And, and I'm really grateful for their help as well. Our fellow adventurers. We absolutely. love you guys. Thank absolutely. you very much. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> And see you all in the next episode of our World Open Innovation Conversations. 
Marcel, I love working with you. Likewise. <laughs> See you in our going. next conversation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.